Glad to see our vacation crowd back this morning. I see tans. I see William Buckhead. There you go. Oh, hey, everybody got to see a brown head back there. We got tans there well. We got sunburn. We got skin. Skin beginning to turn loose in place and it's supposed to be stuck to because people can do what they're supposed to do. But, but that's all right. Even Stephen got a tan. How'd you manage that? You don't know what he what? Is that what he wants to do? He wouldn't want to step on the umbrella all day. All day. All day. All I'm going to do. Twelve hours. Twelve hours on the umbrella. All right. Glad to be back with y'all tonight. Glad to be here today. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's message. Uh, Becky and I went the other day to Lifeway. We've done some looking around and stuff. And Becky and I have actually fixed to start a couple study on uh, what line we're going to do. Start we start tomorrow night. We want to actually start a couple study uh, for, for her and I, and anybody who wants to ride all the way to Washington, sit down for a few minutes is welcome to. But uh, just some stuff that her and I can just get together and sit down and spend some time with. But um, got some other information, some other literature and stuff. And there's something that I've learned recently about you know being in this position and doing what I do is if you'll remember back about my start and how I got started in the ministry and everything, I never really went through a time period of being taught. And, you know, Becky and I were at Kenneth for just a little while, and not long at all. I mean, we're talking probably less than a year, probably less than just a few months. Uh, from the time that we were there, uh, I began to go out and start speaking. So there was a lot of Sundays that I actually wasn't at church, and the other Sundays I would be working. And so it, it really, a lot of the things that I've done, and I know the Lord has blessed me with it because I couldn't do it on my own. There's no way, because I don't know how to teach myself as far as things like that. So uh, we passed the literature of day, and it's really, really helped me. And I would challenge you to go down there sometimes. And if you if you ever just sit down and read the Bible and stuff like that, I know for myself, it's hard for me to just kind of put things together sometimes. And you can find literature down there that can really help you. But I've talked with Stephen about it, about some things. and. Uh, since he's, you know, teaching the Sunday school class, man, I would challenge any teacher of a Sunday school class or whatever to go down there and ask for some literature to help you with this stuff. But I tell you, it's really helped me a lot. It's tough. You know, we're going on almost five years now, and after a while, sermons get harder and harder to come by. You know, because, I mean, I've even used a few of them twice since I've been here. Well, I don't want to get to the point where I'm using the same ones over and over and over again, so there's always a need for new information and stuff. So this will help. So I'm, I'm enjoying doing this, this new study that we're dealing with now and this new information literature. But it also challenges me, and it shows me one thing. I didn't know near as much as I thought I knew about God's Word. And I think that every one of us in here, if we were honest with ourselves, would say the same thing. We don't know near as much. Ray said, I hate to tell you, but you don't know near as much about God's Word as you think you do. Ain't that that funny? It's, it is, ain't it? It is. It truly is. Now, Becky, I ain't going to tell her that. I'll let you tell her. Okay, how about that? If you can, you do that. You do that. But anyhow, you know, just to, and one reason I want to emphasis, you know, put emphasis on this this morning is there's a lot of things going on on TV right now. A lot of things on TV that you see in the news and things like that about current events and stuff like that. The more you know about what goes on in here, the more it'll help you understand that we can still live with peace, knowing about what, knowing what's going on in the world today. Not talking about that today, though. I am talking about something else. Without a shadow of doubt, the absolute easiest way for us to live in peace with others, with family, with ourselves, and most of all with God, is to abide in His Word. We talked about that word, abide, this morning. Uh, Abide in his word. God's word explains to each and every one of us the way in which we should live. Notice I did not say God's word will give us give us every answer to every question. It will simply show us how to live and it will answer the important questions. As a matter of fact, there's more answers to the important questions in this one book than there is to all the other books in the world combined. All the information, all the literature, all the stuff that Stephen discussed and studied in college about science and all that, all that stuff is great, it's fun, it's important, things like that. But nothing in any of those books, all added together in all of the versions and in all of the languages and all of the religions and all of all of it, 
adds up to what this one book can give you as far as answers of the important questions that we have. And I'm talking about the important question now. I'm not talking about things that we think are important that are not really important. This book gives us historical evidence. Did you know that some of the archaeologists now over in Israel and over in Jerusalem and over in, in, in that area has actually used the Bible to help them go find ancient sites, ancient ruins? They've used the Bible to do that. We already see God's word coming true in what's happening in Israel right now. We already see God's word coming true in the great uh, in, the, in the Dead Sea. We've all, I, mean, I don't know if all of you have heard about it, but the Dead Sea is living proof. The Dead Sea is living proof. I don't really that up. <clears throat> the Dead Sea is proof that God's word is coming to me. So the, the, the answers that we need, the answers that we need are in here. The answers that we like to have is in all the other books. But the answers that we need is in here. Now, what I want to do is I want to read something to you this morning. I'm not going to ask you to write these verses down. I do have a list of them. List of them. If, if you want to now, you know, to, to copy or whatever. But everything I'm going to be reading is out of the book of Proverbs. Now, these verses are not in, these are not all in one order. I didn't just take a chapter of Proverbs and just go through and read the whole chapter. I went and specifically picked out verses. Because there's something I want to explain to you about the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, that we talked about last week, for those of you that were not here, is a book of wisdom. It's one of the four wisdom books. Now, with it being a wisdom book, if we read it, and we adhere to what it says, and we abide by what it says, life should be easier. Joyce is already a perfect example. Man, ain't life easier since you start reading Proverbs. Yeah. Yeah. Don't it make no sense? Don't life make no sense if you start reading? It has a lot of answers in that. Exactly. Exactly. So here we go. I'm going to read a few verses from the book of Proverbs. And y'all listen to it. And I'm going to follow up with a verse. The ending verse is something that's just going to, it's going to put an exclamation point on everything that's being talked about, okay? So, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. But whoever listens to me will live safety and be at ease without fear or harm. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. <coughs> Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of the one who has no sense. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children, children is careful to discipline them. A quick-tempered person does foolish things, and the one who devises evil schemes is hated. Last verse says this righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Is that not a verse to finish on? Is that not a verse to finish on with what's going on in this world today? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Now, we've read all these, and these are just a few of the Proverbs. 
These are just this is just a touch of how many proverbs there are and how many truthful things it says. So everybody in here that comes to this church lives by every one of these proverbs, right? We all do. Hold your hand if you live by all these proverbs. Come on, somebody at least hold up part of a hand. No, we don't. No, we don't. But you live all these proverbs, Billy Joe, Billy, Matt, Gigi, Marsha, Rebecca, Ron, Tanner, Mary. Do we all live by all these proverbs? Why don't we? Why don't we? I'm not going to ask you to answer that right now. We'll probably get back to that in mind. But why don't we live all these proverbs? Well, because if we did, if we did, then all would be right. All the things would be good. All our ducks would be in a row. All the I's dotted. All the P's crossed. Peaches and cream. Puppies and petals. petals. Why don't we? God has given us, in just these few verses, just these few, the instructions on how to live our lives, how to watch our tongue, how to be righteous, what happens to us? And that's what I want to talk about to you now. Is, is everything about the, the book of Proverbs tells us, God's telling us, if you will do this, this is what's going to happen. If you do right, I will honor you. If you do wrong, I will throw you into the pit. That's what, basically, that's what it's saying. If you do right and honor me, I will honor you. If you will remember me, I will remember you. If you watch your tongue, you will be blessed. If you run your mouth, you will be cursed. If you love your neighbor, I will love you. If you don't love your neighbor, then there's not love in you. The book of Proverbs is a, is a book that says, if you have this, in algebra, what is it called? What is it called? When you got something on each side of the side that you want. What does that mean? What does that mean? Ain't that a word for it? Somebody help. Balance. 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 Very good. That is a good word. Who said that? Come on. Cool. You want to have your rest of it? No. Okay. In order for us to have balanced lives, we must be balanced with the one that gives us a life. Does that not make sense? But are we? No. No. But if we did, we would live a life that would be with peace, would be the ultimate peace. It would be ultimate joy. It'd be ultimate faith. It'd be ultimate satisfaction in the one who has us, the one who created us. But do we? No. But you, but you know what? This is what I want to share with you, and this is what I want to get to this morning, because there's a lot more going on here than I'm leading into, than I'm betting on. Even if we did, if, even if, if I took these proverbs and I said, "Hey, John." Here's these proverbs right here. There's another 150 or 200 to go with them. Go live your life just exactly like these proverbs say. If John done that, which there's no way he could, but if he did, if he did, if he done that, if I said, here, Sam, here's the proverbs, just take these and go live by them. Sam's already saying, hey, she ain't no way, huh? Okay. Allison, if I said, here, here's these proverbs, just take these. And it don't matter what happens to McDonald's or whatever, or whatever you get upset about, or anything like that, or if you car tatted up, just take these proverbs and everything will be fine. If you just live by these proverbs, if I were to do that with each and every one of you in here, and every one of us in here abide by them, abide by God's word exactly like He told us to. If you'll notice, I don't know where, <clears throat> where it went. The name of this morning's message is instruction, not perfection. Lives would still not be perfect. Even if we live exactly the way God's word tells us to live. And you say, well, that don't make no sense. Yes, it does. Because, because, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Job. Because, in the book of Job, we learn something. Job 22, we're going to learn this morning. That no matter how we live our life, how right it is, how long it is, how indifferent it is, how much we love others, how much we don't love others, how much we have hatred in our heart, how much we don't have hatred in our heart, 
how much we work for the kingdom of God, how much we don't work for the kingdom of God. We're going to learn something this morning about something that is so much bigger than us, it ain't even funny. And what we're going to learn is fixing to be read out to you. And, and, and I'm going to read these verses to you. We're going to be in the, in the book of Job. We're going to be in the first chapter. I'm going to read verse 1, and then I'm going to drop down and read verses 6 through 12, okay? I'm going to read verse 1, and then drop down and read 6 through 12. Verse 1 says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he had? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely cuss you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out in the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. Father, teach us this morning. Teach me. Teach us in here what you're trying to, the, the message. Preach the message this morning, Lord, that you, you're trying to get across to us in this book. Help us to understand why, if, even if we live exactly according to your word, that there's just sometimes things that we don't have any control over. Father, just help us to live more at peace, knowing that you love us, knowing that you are a sovereign Lord, and knowing that one day we will begin our eternity with you for those of us to know you. And I ask these things in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I don't care what you're doing in your life. I don't, what's, I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care. I don't care if you had a, a hard time. I don't care if the last two years of your life have been just a struggle. You say you had something in your life the last two years. It's just been a struggle. And then all of a sudden you've gotten out of it. And all of a sudden you come, you come to church now. And all of a sudden things seem to be going good. And, and you're learning and you're growing and you're attending. And you're even mentioning the Jesus to other people. You're, you're talking about the Lord. You're representing him in a way that is, is glorifying his name. I don't care who you think you are in God right now or who you actually are in God. There's always, always an opportunity for this conversation to take place about you. Listen to what I'm telling you. There is always an opportunity for this conversation to take place about you. You never know what's really going on with God. You never really know what's going on with God. Your life can seem so structured. Your life can seem so good. Your life can seem so put together. Your life can just be honestly, just even though some of us look at day to day things in my day, for the most part, everybody has got wonderful lives compared to what some of the people across the ocean have. Some of the people in the cities have. Some of the people that have that have parents that, that are are drug stricken. Some of the people that brought up in alcoholism that, that are that are just just start really poor right now. We all have lives in here that are really really blessed. You never know when life is as good as it is right now when something may happen. And let me explain something else to you. As much as you might want to know why. Sometimes we never know why it happens. But let me explain something else to you. God has a reason for all of it happening. He has a reason. I want to share some stuff with you this morning. I want to share some stuff with you about the book of Job. Uh, there's some interesting things about the book of Job. For those of you who don't know a whole lot about it, let's take Job right now and just kind of break the book down right quick. I'm going to kind of break this down until we get to, the, uh, to what the message is this morning. First of all, we really don't know who wrote the book of Job. We really don't know. It doesn't say exactly who wrote the book of Job. 
We've also heard that the setting seems to be ancient. It's very possible that, ancient, that, that Job is like one of the oldest manuscripts or one of the oldest writings there was. That's on one side of the coin. If you look at the other side of the coin, in the book of Job, when it goes on, to, when he's sitting down with his friends and having conversation, his friends makes what you would consider, um, they, they go back and say things that they possibly have written, they are read in the book of Proverbs. So they may be falling back on some text that's already been written from the book of Proverbs and from some of the other wisdom books. So we really don't know. Job could either be like the oldest book, or it could be written sometime during the time of Solomon. We really don't know exactly when Job was written. Now, it's interesting about this. It's one of the few Old Testament books in which Satan actually appears. A few of one of the few Old Testament books in which Satan actually appears. We know Satan appears in the garden, but actually it talks about in the Old Testament, this is one of the times that Satan appears. It talks about Satan and God having this conversation. So that's very interesting to read in, 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 in all. That's interesting also. Now, for those of you that don't know, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but for those of you that don't know, after all is said and done through the book of Job, God talks to Job. So God talks with Job, and he talks to Job in a way that is beautiful Hebrew poetry. We don't know why he does. We don't know why he does. It's probably maybe the only time in Scripture when God actually talks to someone in poetry. But God just don't sit there and just talk to Job and say, well, Job, this is what happened. This is why I've done it. And this is all this. And this is all that. No, it's got nothing to do with Job. It's got all to do with him. God sits there and talks to Job in a form of poetry, not about Job and his trials and his tribulations, but he talks to Job about one thing, one thing specifically. He says, I am God. I am the one that puts this earth here. I am the one that takes care of this earth. I am the one that controls this earth. I am the one that puts the birds in the air. I'm the one that puts the, the sky in the air. I'm the one that puts the ground under your feet. I am the one that does all this. It's got nothing to do with you. But he talks it to him in, 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 in Hebrew and he speaks it to him in a poem, in a, in a poem. And this is what I want to get to this morning. Job is one of the only books in God's Word that deals with this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Job is one of the only books, if not the only book, that deals with why the bad things happen to good people. And it does it in such a way that if you will read the book of Job and you will see everything that happened to him, you will realize that there's a lot of people living that we know of, that we know of right now, that if this same thing that happened to Job would have happened to us, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have been able to live with it. We know people right now live in a society of materialism. We know that family is getting further and further away from being what a family truly is. We know that people put their, high, their whole entire lives, they dedicate their whole entire lives into striving for one goal, and that one goal is to be financially stable. How many people do we know work? All the time, when Job says, "Naked I arrive, naked I will return." How many people do we know when one little thing happens in their lives, they just go to shambles? Their life just deteriorates and it falls around them, and there's nothing good anymore. How many people do we know? Do we know anybody in here? Are you one of them? I can tell you right now, I've had my struggle. I've been through my hard time. George is agreeing with me. If anybody in this congregation thinks right now that I'm just up here preaching to hear my voice today, you're wrong. Because I've lived through some of this. Okay? I've got heart. I've got a real heart in this message today because I've lived through some of it. And I know that some of you in here have lived through things harder than I have. And I know there's some people in here that's not nowhere near lived through what some other people in here live through. But I tell you this, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, None of us will get through any of it without the God in heaven that give us his son, as I say. It's not going to happen. So you can put all your trust in whatever you want to put it in, but unless you put your trust in him, you can take all this and you can throw it out the window and take a quarter to it so you say you've lost something. Because it won't mean anything to you. Listen to what this message said today. 
Listen to the words that God uses. Listen to how he talks about Job. Listen to what he does about it. Listen to how Job reacts. Listen to who Satan really is. And this morning's message, there's a few, there's a few points that I want you to write down. And these points are so, so damn important. They're so important. And if you'll just listen to them, you'll just, you'll just think about what's being said. Hopefully, if there's some things you've been struggling with in your life, this morning's message will help you with this. First of all, if if Job deals with the question of why does bad thing happen to good people, the first thing I want you to understand, and you may throw rocks at me until the cows come home. I don't care. But the first thing you've got to understand sitting in here today is that there is no such thing as good people. Period. Now, a lot of you are going to probably sit back and say, whoa, what's he talking about? I know good people. No, no, no. You know good people as far as you're concerned. I'm talking about good people as far as God is concerned. The one that makes the difference on who decides who is good, who is not, who is righteous, who is not. There's no such thing as good people. No such thing. The book of Romans in 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When it says all have sinned, that means all. That means that as much as I love her, Becky's grandmother, which is part of the reason I'm standing in front of you today, was not a good person as far as God is concerned until she come to know Christ Jesus as a Savior. Sweetest woman you ever made in your life. I'm sure everybody in here has got somebody like that in their family. I'm sure there's every one of you right now. If I could, think, if I could ask you who the sweetest person is that you ever met in your life, I guarantee you somebody in here, everybody in here has got somebody in their life that they were put on that pedestal being the sweetest, most kindest, most gentle, most loving, the, the, the most good person they are on the face of the world. And you would be right in your opinion of that person, but not God's opinion. God's opinion is the one that matters. Not ours. Not ours. We think because if you're not Hitler and you're not Mother Teresa, you're somewhere in between. I tell you right now that God's word says all have sinned and all have fallen short. Simple as that. So, in the verse of the in, in Job chapter one and verse eight, I want you to go back and I want you to read something. Job chapter one and verse eight. Job chapter one and verse eight. <clears throat> What's done happen here is the Satan, he's wandering around, he's looking for somebody. He's looking for somebody. You know, the old song, Devil went down to Georgia, he was looking for a soul to steal. You think that don't really happen? Yeah. You think that's just a song Charlie Daniels done a long time ago? By the way, that's one of the only songs I know all the words to. <laughs> I can't say it quite as fast as he can, but I know about all the words now. And I know that that song was set up on, on, on you know, on Charlie Daniels uh, making his cute little song. I'm sure he won a lot of money by it. I mean, I mean, I'm sure he made a lot of money. But you know that there's a lot of truth in that song? I mean, what does God's word say a while ago? He didn't say, what you do? He said, I've been roaming the earth. From one end to the other, I've been looking for somebody. I'm looking for a soul to steal. Do you realize that all the souls that's ever been created by a most holy God is available to either Satan or God or one or another? Check that out. It, just, just pretend that you're fruit on the tree. And here's your soul. And Satan's walking around. He's looking at the tree. He's walking through the orchard. And he's looking at them. And he's looking at all these souls around. And he's noticing all these souls. He sees all these souls just hanging there. And do you realize that some of these souls, they could be souls of people in here, are willing to let Satan pick them off the branch. Think about that. You say, well, it's just a song talking about No, it's this, yeah. Satan roaming from one end of the earth to the other, looking for souls to what to steal from most holy God. So, so what does it say? If Satan's wandering around, he's doing all this stuff, and he's looking for somebody, God loves the ones who love him, okay? God loves the ones who love him, but God also knows that at the end of the day, even the ones of us he loves, he still gives us a choice of how we're going to live our lives with him. Then the Lord said to Satan, and you considered my servant Job, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. 
Well, we know by God saying he is blameless and upright that Job is considered a righteous man. And we know when God calls you righteous, you are righteous. We know that you are of the family of God when God calls you righteous, calls you shameless, I mean, uh, blameless, and, and calls you upright. But check this out. Way before it gets to all that stuff, it says, have you considered my what? My servant, Job. <coughs> See, God don't go on and say, well, this is Job. He's righteous. He's untouchable. He's upright. He's famous. He's rich. He's got a big family. He's got four cars in the garage. He's got the wonderful dog. He's got beautiful wine. He's got the most wonderful place up at the lake. He's got all the boats. He's got all the pontoons. He's got all the four wheelers. He got the, he's got the big old hunting club down there. He's got the whole land on. This is Joe. Look at Joe. This is my Joe. No. What does God say to begin with? He says, if you consider my heart, my servant, Joe. My servant. My servant, Joe. Let me explain something. Don't take this morning's message as if I'm just talking to the ones that have had loss in their life. Okay? Everybody in here has had loss. Some way more dramatic than others. Way more detrimental to what the Spirit can receive and what the Spirit can live with than others. I'm not talking about just someone that has lost someone. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about every day, day to day life. I'm talking about what happens on our job. I'm talking about what happens in our house. I'm talking about the arguments behind closed doors. I'm talking about the, the, the adulterous thoughts that goes on behind doors. I'm talking about anything that's in your refrigerator. I'm talking about anything that you look at when you look at magazines. I'm talking about anything you look at while you're on the internet. I'm talking about anything that affects you in a way that you become something that God can't use. A lot of people want to just throw it up and say, well, this happened to me, and I can't believe God let this happen, and I'm done with it, so I'm just done with him. He can just take whatever he wants to. <clears throat> as much as you love holding on to grief, as much as you love holding on to doubt, as much as you love holding on to hurt, as much as you love holding on to the anguish, as much as you love holding on to the sadness, as much as you love holding on to the unrest, as much as you love holding on to the misery, as much as you love holding on to the self-pity, as much as you love hanging on to the unknown, and as much as you love hanging on to the depression that you battle with in your life, because you're not who you want to be, you have not had the life you want to have, at the end of the day, it's not about you. You can like what I just said, or you can not like it. It's not me saying it. It's God's word saying it. God has used a man in his word that God says was righteous. God says was blameless. God says was upright. But the first thing he called him was a son. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, we do not become someone on a pedestal. We become a servant of God. The first thing in our lives that we should be concerned with is how and in what way we are to serve our master. And you know what happens? We let life get in the way. We let the things we like that we don't have get in the way. We like the things that we do like get in the way. We like the things we don't have get in the way. We like the things we have get in the way. We like the things that we don't want to lose get in the way. We like the things that we have lost, get in the way. We like all things that get in the way of us being exactly what God called Job, a servant. He says, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless enough by a man who fears God but shuns him. Does Job fear God for nothing sacrifice? That Satan asked God, just imagine that was your name right now. Just imagine that Satan is asking God right now. Just, just say, for instance, I'm going to pick on Will this morning. I'm going to pick on Will. Just see this conversation going on between God and Satan about Will Crook right now. How would it go, Will? Would it be easy? Would you like the conversation? Would anybody in here like the conversation? 
Would anybody want to hear what was being said? Would I really want to hear what God got to say about me when Satan's looking for somebody? And when I when he comes walking by, God says, What you doing, Satan? He says, I'm just looking for a soul still. And you consider my servant Martin? He is. Whoa. What am I? What am I in God's eyes? What am I to him? What are you to him? God considered Job first before anything was servant. And until we take on the attitude of a servant, the rest of this stuff that he called him means nothing. And until we take on the attitude of a servant, all these things in our life to bring us down will continue to bring us down. Because at the end of the day, if we know Christ as our Savior, you just put yourself aside and you've allowed him to become the master and you are not the one that matters anymore. It's him. Not you. It's him, not me. It's him. Do you realize right now, sitting in this church, that God may be wanting to do something in your life? But he's going to have to go talk to Satan before he can do it. Do you think no time in Scripture that something bad happens? Just because, just so somebody can get the word in edgewise? Does anybody know about the scripture where the man wants to talk to the man? I can't remember the name. Don't ask me to. You know, I ain't good at that part. That's where my uneducatedness comes in at. That is a word. Uneducatedness is a word. When the man wants to talk to the man, the man says, I ain't studying you. The man wants to talk to the man, the man says, I ain't studying you. He says, Let me talk to the man. I ain't studying you. Leave me alone. What does the man do? He goes out and burns his field. Where is he at? He gets an opportunity to talk to him. But he had to burn his field to get to him. Careful what your field is right now. Careful what your life is right now. Careful what you're paying attention to right now. Careful what you put your, your interest in right now. Careful what you put your dedication into right now. Careful what you put your heart into right now. Because there may be a conversation going on. And it may sound something like this. Say, what you doing? I'm just roaming. You think Satan is just like a catfish. It's just like a catfish. Don't forget this. A catfish. Bottom. He's a bottom brother. He's just kind of wandering around. He's wandering around. But what's he got? He's got these tentacles hanging out the side like this. I heard an old teller one time. Somehow, some people just make up the biggest lies you've ever heard in your life. Biggest lies you've ever heard in your life. Now, me and Buck have been to the dam before. We've been to the dam. Oh, no. A lot of people have been to the dam before. And they talk about how big the catfish was at the dam. They said they had one cornered at the dam one time years ago, so they feed him a whole chicken at the time. The catfish don't bite the whole chicken, eat the whole chicken. That's, what, that's the way they feed But the biggest one I ever heard was there was some scuba divers went down at the bottom of the corn field down, and they swam down there, and they come up and say, We ain't done it! We ain't done it! We ain't done it! Why? They said the catfish down there was so big that his whistle was bigger than a man's arm when it came to the side of the head. Say, good grace of life, that's a big old whisker. <laughs> so let's just say it was true. Let's just, we just go assume for a minute that that scuba diver went out and he seen a cat big that his whisker was so big, it was big as a man's arm with the tattoo side of his. That's pretty long whisker. Them whiskers are for feeling. They're for checking out what's going on around you. They're sensory. They've got sensory organs on them. They're for checking things out. Help me, Stephen. What else are they for? You decide, baby. They got all these sensory things. They got these feelers. Have any of y'all ever seen that mold that's got like a bunch of worms on it in his nose? Is that not disgusting? But it's a mold. I forgot, it's a mold rat or something like that. But it's this little mold, and he got like a bunch that look like worms sticking out of his nose. It's like sensory glands. Now, this really happened to my grandma. My grandma used to go up on a picture. And her and my and I reckon it was, was fishing a John boat one day. If you've never fished two people in a John boat, you better know right now, be careful how you catch. Okay? I did go in the murder room to Tom Jordan one time with a paw hanging out my ear. <laughs> so my brother caught me. He reads back the reel, he got ready to cast, and he went, <clears throat> like that. He thought he was hugging the bush, and he went, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> My grandmother was sitting in a John boat. Her sister got ready to cast, came home, fishing for brim, 
And she said she felt something hit her in the face. And she said, it looked down, and there was red wiggles on the nose. My sister caught her in the nose with a hook with all the red wiggles on her. So there she was with a hook with red wiggles on her. It's like that mold, right? Like, Since they're open. We got, we got all kinds of stuff going on. But the point about it is, I don't know how I got off on that. <laughs> Satan's got, he's got, instead of having these sensory organs, man, he's making a wonderful face right now. It's just a lovely little face. He's just making a face. It's true. It's a mold. It's got these things. <laughs> Satan not only has got feelings of his own, guess what else he's got? He's got demons. He's got demons. And what are they looking for in us? They're looking for weaknesses. What are they looking for? They're looking for sad moments. They're looking for depression. They're looking for they're looking for hurt. They're looking for hatred. They're looking for scorn. They're looking for someone that's that's jealous. They're, they're looking for someone that's holding a grudge. They're looking for all these things. You know why? Because a demon can get in there and Satan can work his demons in the way. He can just get to us and he can take a mobile and make a man out of it. And just as soon as that starts happening in your life, God cannot use you. But I tell you this, regardless of what's going on in your life, how much, you, how much you've lost, how much you've suffered, how much you will suffer, God has something for you to do. He has something for you to do. Now, one or two things should be going on. Right now, in your life, is about God wanting to do one or two things. If something's going on in your life or has been on in your life, it means God is trying to do one thing and that's reach you. Or he's trying to do the next thing and that's use you to reach somebody else. We talked last week about the character of a person. The only way you know a person's true character is when you see that person in a real life event and see how they live through that real life event. You'll never ever know who the best baseball player is until you say it get on the field and watch him play baseball. You'll never ever know who the strongest person is in the world until you see him reach down and pick up more weight than anybody else. You can have titles all day long, but you cannot have character unless you have been through it. You cannot. In times like this when we struggle, in times like this when we're depressed, in times like this, this is time for us to be building character in our Savior. We're supposed to be growing in our Savior instead of depressing and becoming nothing in our Savior. Do we struggle with it? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. My face will lose muscle. The third thing I want to talk to you about, if you can get past holding on to all this and let God use you, the third thing I want you to talk about is I want you to turn over to chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. Now, what has happened is, Satan has come to God. He said, God, I'm going to take everything he's got. And I'm going to see if he'll still pray you. Well, guess what? Satan come in. He took everything that Job had. He took his family. He took all his possessions. He burned his houses down. And he took everything away from him. And Job still stirred firm in God. He did not sin against God. Scripture said he did not sin against God. You know what? Satan wasn't satisfied, and he never will be satisfied with us. Okay? He wasn't satisfied. He goes back to God. He says, Lord, he says, uh, he says, uh, he didn't say anything bad about you this time. But I guarantee you, if you'll let me put a hurt on him, he'll he'll curse you. And God says, There's my servant Job. Go do what you will, but you cannot kill him. So Satan brought on sores, and he brought on pain, and he brought on anguish, and he brought on misery, true misery. You want to know how bad the misery was? It says in verse 7, 7, So Satan went out in the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet and crowned his head. Has anybody had chicken pox? Let me focus that chicken pox. Did y'all, has anybody have, has anybody ever had, had, had a real, real bad case? What you have, brother? You have, yeah, I'm in the hospital room. Really? Did you get them in your mouth? You mouth, no, yeah. You did you get them in your mouth and all that? Who all got in your mouth? That's messed up. Watch your eye. Anybody get in the eyes? 
Okay? It's, it's chicken pox are really messed up, okay? And I'm not looking at getting before and getting older because they say that you got this, the chicken pox thing, you can have shingles. Shingles don't appear to be too nice either. None of this compared to what Joe had, okay? None of this. If you can imagine a little chicken pox, they even a, uh, a scar, and they will. I've seen people that have been scarred from them. That's nothing compared to what Joe had happened to him. So let's, let's read on a little bit more. <clears throat> this is how bad it was for Joe. So Satan went out to the president of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soul of Satan and crammed in. Nowhere in his body did he get caught. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. That's bad, folks. That's bad. That man's in misery. He's trying to get the sores off of him. He's done took a piece of broken pottery and trying to scrape this thing off of him. Trying to get it up. Trying to get some relief. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. It was so bad she basically told him, look, enough is enough. You know you're going to be with him. Just go on and just blaspheme God. Go on and cuss at him so he'll go and take you out and you ain't got to keep living in this. That's what she told him. That's what she told him. Why don't you just curse God and die? He replied, are you, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Folks, I want to explain something to you. I want to share something with you right now. Did you know that the book of Job could have stopped right now? The book of Job could have stopped right there. Could have been ended right there. Could have been no more of the book of Job. We could have got all we needed out of what just happened. In those few verses, chapters 1 and 2, Kind of got all we need out of the book of Job. Satan comes to God, God gives Job up, take, Satan takes everything from him, he brings on sickness, he brings on pain, he brings on fear, he brings on loss, he brings on everything awful that we could possibly ever think of. The most precious things to us, he took everything we have material, everything he wanted, he got. Satan got everything but one thing that's Job's life, and Job never turned away from being faithful to God. That proves. That there is still faithfulness when everything around you is going to hell. Okay? That proves that faithfulness in God can stand. Job had something that a lot of people struggle with, and that's character. He stood firm in his faith. And that's all we needed. But even Job, standing firm in his faith, made a terrible, terrible mistake. He made a dreadful mistake. If you will look, when this chapter could have ended in verse 10, the very next verse says, When Job's three friends, and that's all I need to say, when Job's three friends, when Job's three friends, let me explain something to you. If we spend as much time and effort worshiping God in time of trouble instead of asking why there are times of trouble, life would be better. I'm going to say it again. If we spend as much time and effort worshiping God in our times of trouble instead of paying attention to why there are times of trouble, life will be better. If we would worship God the way He truly wanted us to, there would be glory in our lives rather than selfish, unanswered questions. Because we all have them. God is meant to be worshipped, not analyzed. Job would have been fine if he stopped there, but he didn't. And all it done was bring on more agony. Do you realize at the point in time when God knew that Job was going to remain faithful, that Job would just stop right there? The book of Job would have finished, and the next 40 chapters would not have been needed. But what happens? We have something happen to us, and we want to know why. We want to know why. Well, let me explain something to you. It ain't always so we don't know why. We ain't always going to know what God's plan for us is. We ain't going to always know why we've suffered long. We ain't going to always know why we've suffered shame. We ain't going to always know why we've suffered hurt. We ain't going to always know 
while we've suffered the way we have. The fourth thing is, and I don't know if you knew of this about the book of Job, but the fourth thing is, God never told Job why he suffered. God never told Job why he suffered. Ain't that amazing? This man lost everything. Literally everything in his life except his own life. And God never told him why. The fifth thing is this, and I'm going to close. Job, Job could have suffered, suffered for one reason and one reason only. Somebody sitting in here today. You think that, that sounds crazy? This could have been 10,000 years ago. But do you realize that Job's suffering 10,000 years ago could have been only for one person sitting in this church today to learn that faithfulness in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, is more important than anything else on this face of this earth. Racy, as he sits here, could have come in this morning not knowing Christ, and had he heard the story of Job, come to know Christ because of the faithfulness he saw in Job, and know that he could have that same faith and that same Savior, and do you know that Job would have went through everything he did just for Racy 10,000 years later? I want to ask you this, and then we're going to close. Are you prepared? For the conversation that God and Satan may be having with you about you right now. And if you're not prepared, would you be willing today to open your heart to a God that loves you? To just simply talk to you? Because if you're not, this whole morning's been for nothing. I challenge you right now to know where you're at in your life and world. I challenge you to look at yourself and say, what if? God and Satan is having this conversation about me right now. Am I prepared for what Satan has to deal with? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now and thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. And Father, I raise this up to you. I raise this message up to you. And I raise each and every one of us in here up to you, Lord. For there is one in here right now that needs the type of faith that Job had. Father, help them understand that the only place they'll ever get it is through the Son that you give on the cross. Father, for the ones of us in here that struggle with law, struggle with, with temptations, struggle with trials, struggle with trib God, tribulations, Lord, help us to understand we don't need to fall apart. We just need to fall at your feet. Because at the end of the day, you are the one it's going to hold us together. <clears throat> For the heart of him that needs Jesus, I ask that they're ready to open up to him now. And I ask these things in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen.